Hey, good morning, Stone Creek Church. It is so good to have you join us online this morning. My name is Jacob. I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm so excited to bring the word. Before I do, let me just say happy Memorial Day. I hope that you and your family are celebrating and reminiscing on all that this wonderful day means to us. And really, we want to be intentional about just saying thank you. Thank you to those who have made the ultimate sacrifice. Thank you to your families and thank you to our veterans who are still serving and still making those sacrifices. It's not in vain and we thank you again for it. As we just as we dive into the word today, I want to start off with a story. There's a story of a world-class pianist named Paderewski. Now maybe you've heard this story before, but as the story goes, there is a concert that he is about to perform at Carnegie Hall. And there is a mother and her son, an eight-year-old boy, who are attending this concert. Well, as the story goes, the eight-year-old boy wanders away from his mom. And as you can imagine, this isn't Walmart. This isn't Meyer. This isn't Target. This is Carnegie Hall. And there are thousands of people around. But this little boy wanders away from his mom and somehow, some way, makes his way to the platform where Paderewski is about to perform. He makes his way onto the platform and finds his way to the piano where the famous pianist will perform. And as you can imagine, this mom is just frantic, looking around, wondering, where is my son? Well, much to her surprise, she looks onto the platform and the worst case scenario is in play. She sees the boy on the piano. And what does the little boy do? The little boy begins to play one of the only songs that he knows, Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. And the mom just goes wild, just runs up to the platform, is just yelling, get off, get off, and just running towards her boy. Well, about this time, the concert begins. Paderewski comes out, and he sees the little boy playing at the piano. And he sits down next to him. And instead of saying, hey, Stop this, knock it off, get out of here, go find your parents. He says, don't stop, keep playing. And what he does while this little boy is just playing twinkle, twinkle, little star, is he wraps his hands around his and he begins to play a beautiful piece. And of course, everybody stops and is listening. But as the story ends, the little boy does find his way back to his mother, but it reminds me, that story reminds me of something. At the end of the day, you and I are the little boy and we're just playing twinkle, twinkle, little star to the best of our abilities. No matter who we are, what type of education or so socioeconomic status we have, at the end of the day, our best is simply twinkle, twinkle, little star. But what happens when the pianist, what happens when the Holy Spirit, the hands of God come upon us, it turns our efforts into something miraculous, something beautiful. And that's what I wanna to talk to you about today. I wanna to talk to you about inviting the hand of God. I'll say it like this, the gracious hand of God upon your life. And when we talk about the gracious hand of God, what we're really doing as we are talking about God's character, who we believe God to be, what we believe about Him, and what we believe He really thinks about us. Now, when it comes to the gracious hand of God, I think this is really important because for many of us, we have a different perspective on who God is, a different perspective on His hand. We often see Him as heavy-handed and hard-hearted. He often doesn't want the best for us. We often think of him withholding things. These are, these are things that 
we have believed about God that are not true, misconceptions that have either come from other people in our life or even our own families, our own fathers, I should say. But the gracious hand of God is so important because it tells of all the things that God desires for you, for me. And the gracious hand of God is found in this beautiful book called Ezra. Ezra was a scribe, but in verse 6, verse 9, and verse 28 in the book of Ezra chapter 7, I want to read a few references as to where we get this idea of the gracious hand of God. It says this in chapter 7, verse 6, This Ezra was a scribe, meaning he took notes. He was well versed in the law of Moses, which the Lord, the God of Israel, had given to the people of Israel. He came up from Jerusalem, came up to Jerusalem from Babylon, and the king gave him everything he asked for. Why? Because the gracious hand of the Lord his God was on him. And then it says this in verse 9, He had left Babylon on April 8th and came to Jerusalem on August 4th. That's a long journey. For the gracious hand of his God was on him. This was because, pay attention, Ezra had determined to study and obey the law of the Lord and to teach those laws and regulations to the people of Israel. Hmm. So now we're learning about why the gracious hand of the Lord was on him. And then in verse 28, and praise him for demonstrating such unfailing love to me and honoring me before the king, all his princes and his council. I love this. I felt encouraged because the gracious hand of the Lord my God was on me. Therefore, I gathered some leaders to Israel, of Israel to return with me to Jerusalem. This is the gracious hand of God. Now, what does the gracious hand of God represent? It represents God's power and presence at work in an individual, a family, or a nation's life. It represents God's desire to pour out his goodness upon you. I think of Jabez and I think of his prayer. This is in 1 Chronicles. He says, Lord, bless me indeed. Enlarge my territory. Keep your hand upon me. He was asking for the power and the presence of God to be with him. He wanted to know that it was near, that it was close, that he hadn't wandered too far, and that there was nothing that he had done that would hinder the hand of God from being upon his life. Now, why was it upon Ezra's life? This is an important question because if we answer this question, we can learn about how you and I can invite the gracious hand of God upon ours. And this is what I believe is the reason. His reverence for God's word said this. It said he was well-versed in the law of Moses. He determined to study and obey the law. He had a reverence for God's word. But more than that, he had a love for God's presence. Throughout the book of Ezra, there are moments where he humbles himself and he cries out to the Lord and he worships him and he exalts his name. And he, in doing so, invites the gracious hand of God to be upon him. Ezra understood that God was not heavy handed towards him. He desired to pour out his goodness upon his life. And God desires to do the same thing for you and I. Which leads me to this thought. There are two responses when it comes to inviting the gracious hand of God. The first one is we can choose to exalt ourselves. We can choose to exalt ourselves against God. Therefore, repelling or pushing away his gracious hand. I think of Daniel chapter 5. There's a king named Belteshazzar. And this is the son of Nebuchadnezzar. This is the Babylonian king. And it says about Belteshazzar 
that he basically mocked the God of Israel, the God of heavens, the God of gods, Yehovah. And it says he took the holy things and he used them in unholy ways at a party that he had hosted for thousands in his kingdom. What had happened when he chose to do so? It says that a hand appeared, fingers of a hand appeared, and began writing upon the wall. But when that happened, he didn't understand what it was saying. So they had to call in Daniel, who came and interpreted the writing on the wall. And ultimately, it was God's wrath against him. It was God humbling him, and not in a good way. It was God's judgment. So we can choose to exalt ourselves and invite God's hand of judgment, or we can choose to humble ourselves and invite God's hand of grace. When we humble ourselves, 1 Peter says this, Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and in due time, He will lift you up. I love that. I want to be honored by God at the end of my life. And therefore, if I want to see that, I need to humble myself under His mighty hand. Now, we need to ask ourselves, what is true for you and I? What is true of God's gracious hand? Because all throughout the scriptures, we see the gracious hand of God. But in what ways is this hand at work? There's a list of 10 things that I want to share. We're going to go through these very quickly. <clears throat> I want you to feel free to check out the sermon notes if you would like to follow along with the scripture references and explore those later. But here are the things that are true of God's gracious hand. It's a hand of creation. It says he established the foundations of the world. He stretched out his hand and placed the stars in the sky. It's a hand of creation. It's a hand of comfort and support. Psalm 118, his hand comforts me. It supports me. When you and I are going through trial or tragedy, it's a comforting hand. It supports us. It's a hand of discipline. Hebrews tells of how God disciplines those he loves. The scriptures teach that what parent would ever not discipline a child that they love? In the same way, God disciplines us. He chastens us in order to prune us, to make us more like him. And that likeness leads to wholeness. So he disciplines those he loves. It's his gracious hand. It's a hand of honor. We just read in 1 Peter that when we humble ourselves under his mighty hand, he will lift us up. I love this one. It is favor and good will. And I have a question. When good things happen to you and I, do we count it as just happenstance? Do we count it as hard work alone, good vibes, or even good karma? Or do we count it as the gracious hand of God. It's a hand of generosity. It's a hand of blessing. God desires to pour out generosity upon you and I. He desires good things for us. It's a hand of victory and authority. He has defeated the enemy. And because he's defeated the enemy, he now sits at the right hand of the Father. Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father the hand of victory, the hand of authority. Here's, the other, here's another one, the hand of power. It's a hand that split the Red Sea, that shut the mouths of lions. It is a hand of power for you and I. And this hand, this gracious hand, is still performing miracles today. It's a hand of provision. He supplies all of our needs, just like He supplied Israel's needs his people's needs. And I love this last one. This is number 10. It is a hand of protection. God will protect us. He will shadow us. He will cover us. 
So these are the things that are true of the hand of God. And with everything that the hand of God represents, I can't help but think that there are still some of us who have yet to experience the realities of His hand, who have yet to experience His favor and His goodwill, His power, His protection, His provision, or even His comfort. And can I just suggest to you that if you have yet to experience His gracious hands upon you, maybe it's time to remove your hands from the equation. Maybe it's time to let go of the leadership of your own life and to submit it wholeheartedly to the person of Jesus Christ. Everything that's true of the gracious hand of God is true in Christ. Those realities are true in Christ. And for you and I, when we surrender our hands, what happens is He covers ours with His. And He brings about these realities. I think of Paderewski, our opening story. God will do infinitely more than you and I could ever ask, imagine, or believe. And all it requires is that we humble ourselves under His mighty hand and completely surrender to Him. And I have found, friends, that as I surrender to God, His ways, His will, His plans are so much better than anything I could ever ever have believed for my own life. And it's not too late and you're not too far gone. And so if that's you and that resonates with you, I want you to just pray this prayer with me and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is the Lord of Lords, that He had humbled Himself and died upon a cross. Why? To break the power of sin and to remove the penalty of sin from our life. And I want you to believe that it's only by putting your faith in that beautiful sacrifice that you can have the life that you have been looking for in Christ, that you can spend eternity with Him. I want you to pray this prayer with me. Holy Spirit, I invite you now to open my eyes, to open my ears, and to open my heart. Show me who Jesus is. I confess to you that I'm a sinner and that I need your grace. I surrender my hands now. I surrender the leadership. I surrender the, the future. I surrender it all to you. And I ask that your hands would cover mine and that you would lead me along the best pathway for my life. Let the realities that are true of your gracious hand become true for me. I surrender myself to you. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus that I pray. And all God's people said, amen, amen, 